Okay, I've got a few spicy hot takes for you guys right now. I reckon that plot twists in horror movies are good, but plot twists in horror movies that are actually hiding in front of you in plain sight are even better. Yeah, I know, very spicy. All jokes aside, there is nothing more satisfying than re-watching one of these movies, only to notice that the big reveal is incredibly obvious once you know it, thanks to some superb foreshadowing and hints placed along the way. So, with that in mind, I'm Josh from Wakul Horror, and these are 10 horror movie twists that were hiding in plain sight. Number 10, Dewey guesses the killer in his first scene, Scream 2022. Although it's usually difficult to deduce the killer's identity in the Scream franchise, many viewers correctly guessed that Amber and Richie were behind the mask in the latest film. The first giveaway is that Ghostface claims to have cloned Amber's phone, just like in Scream 3 at the very start, and a lot of viewers simply didn't think that the franchise would be lazy enough to use this trope again, and so suspected it was a bluff. Likewise, Amber is the one being threatened in the introduction, apparently unknowingly, yet this is never brought back as a plot pointer even mentioned again. And that's because Amber was actually in on it from the very beginning and was letting herself be filmed in this scene. As for Richie, well, the most obvious clue is when Dewey just outright tells the gang that Richie is the most likely person to be Ghostface since the killer is usually the seemingly loving boyfriend. He says this the very first time he meets the group and well, it turns out that he was exactly exactly bang on the money. Hell, Richie even comments on this at the end of the movie. Sadly, nobody paid attention, least of all Dewey himself, who ended up getting gutted. Number 9. Documents reveal the actual date, Final Destination 5. In Final Destination 5, Sam, Molly, and numerous others barely escape with their lives from a collapsing bridge accident. And you know what that means by now. The Grim Reaper is going to pick them off one by one. In the climax, Sam and Molly avoid being killed though, seemingly cheating death once more. To celebrate, they decide to take a vacation to Paris, but as the plane prepares to take off, they notice a fight between Carter and Alex, two characters who appeared in the first Final Destination, which is set in 2000. Only then does the audience realize that Final Destination 5 isn't a sequel, but actually a prequel, and Sam and Molly have boarded the famous Flight 180 that's destined to explode immediately after takeoff. And for as good as this twist was, there are actually numerous hints previously that this film takes place in the past. For instance, at around the 40 minute mark, the camera focuses on Isaac's gift certificate, which expires on the 30th of the 6th, 2001. Likewise, Williams's van has a Liberty license plate that went out of date in 2001, while numerous characters use decidedly old looking tech, including clunky keyboards and old fashioned phones. Also, the movie never uses music released after the millennium. If you spotted any of these observations, you might have just thought that the characters were old fashioned or being retro, you know? I mean, 2000s are very in right now, but upon watching the epilogue, the truth becomes clear. Number eight, Laurie's angry reaction, Happy Death Day. In Happy Death Day, a teenager called Tree is going about her day when she's suddenly stabbed to death by a masked serial killer colloquially called Babyface. But death actually isn't the end of her troubles because suddenly Tree wakes up only to realize that time has reset to the previous day. And no matter what she does or where she goes, Babyface kills her again and again and again. Even though each day begins with her roommate Laurie offering her cupcake though, she always discards it desperate to find out who's hunting her. After all, she has bigger problems than accepting a cupcake or not. When she convinces herself that she can't escape the cycle though, she actually just gives up and finally agrees to eat Laurie's cupcake. But when she dies immediately after accepting, she realizes that the cupcake was poisoned and Laurie has been the masked killer all along. Interestingly though, viewers could have figured this out if they simply studied Laurie's body language earlier. See, every time Tree rejects the cupcake, you might assume that Laurie would be confused or concerned or whatever. But every time Tree refuses to eat it, Laurie looks noticeably angry. It's one of those subtle details you missed the first time around, but it becomes as clear as day on a second viewing. Number seven, some serial killer knowledge, Predators. In Predators, a group of strangers find themselves hunted by alien warriors on another world. The team consists of a cartel enforcer, a sniper, an RUF soldier, a mercenary, a Yakuza, a death row inmate, a Marine, and a doctor called Edwin. 
Because each person has a history of killing and are all, by my estimations anyway, hard as nails, the team believed that they were specifically chosen by the Predators since they would serve as a challenging sport to chase. However, because one of them, Edwin, seems totally harmless and he's played by Topher Grace after all, they assume that he was just picked up to keep his teammates alive with his medical skills. But during the climax, Edwin is actually revealed to have been a serial killer who is intent on killing them all. Some viewers suspected that there was more to Edwin than he was initially letting on since it didn't make sense why the Predators would choose him for their game if he wasn't as dangerous as the others. I mean, what's to stop him getting killed early on and then having his quote-unquote purpose just be completely erased? However, Edwin's sinister side is implied early on. At one point, he comes across a chemical and instantly recognizes its toxicity. Upon the first viewing, you'd assume that Edwin recognizes the toxin due to his medical experience, but upon a rewatch, it's obvious that Edwin has used this neurotoxin to subdue his victims many, many times in the past. Number six, the food is the key. Orphan. In Orphan, Kate and John Coleman decide to adopt a child called Esther to help them with their troubled marriage. When they notice a series of accidents occurred immediately after adopting the girl though, the Colemans suspect that there's something seriously wrong with her. And would you know it, they are totally right. Not only is she a cold-blooded killer, but she's not even a child. Due to a hormone deficiency, Esther looks like a young lass despite being in her 30s. She's pretended to be a child for years so she can finally be embraced by a loving family. In hindsight, the twist seems obvious. Esther constantly wears thick, frilly dresses to hide her grown-up figure, and her adoptive family find it odd how she spends so much time getting ready in the morning, unaware that she's applying makeup to look younger. However, the most discernible clue of Esther's true age is how she eats. To hide her adult teeth, Esther wears childlike dentures. And because of this, she has to chop up all of her food into tiny pieces just so she can eat it. And the film isn't coy about this detail at all, since there's an entire scene dedicated to her step brother belittling her for the way that she cuts up her food. So yeah, this little freak was hiding in plain sight the whole time. Number five, everyone is acting around Teddy, Shutter Island. In Shutter Island, US Marshal Teddy Daniels and his partner Chuck head out to an isolated mental institution to investigate the disappearance of an inmate. After stumbling on multiple inconsistencies with the head doctor's claims though, Teddy believes the facility is harboring a dark secret. In the end though, Teddy learns that he's an inmate of Shutter Island called Andrew, and this case was devised by the facilitator to help him accept the fact that he, in fact, murdered his wife. His partner Chuck is revealed to be his psychiatrist, Dr. Sheehan, who went along with this scheme to keep Teddy in check. To some, this was a jaw-dropping revelation, but if you overanalyze every frame, you may have spotted a few things that just didn't quite sit right. For instance, when Chuck is asked to hand over his gun, he has trouble pulling the weapon out of its holster, since he obviously has no experience handling a firearm, which, of course, is weird for a US Marshal. Likewise, when Teddy asks Bridget about Dr. Sheehan, she quickly glances at Chuck, implying that they are one and the same. There are a few clues throughout as well that people are just acting around Teddy, and they'll actually drop the performance should they think that he's not looking. Number four, so many hints about Adelaide, Us. In Us's opening scene, a girl called Adelaide Wilson encounters her doppelganger, which leaves her so traumatized that she refuses to speak. Years later, the Wilson family find their house invaded by their own doubles, who call themselves the Tethered, which is led by Adelaide's counterpart, Red. But in the closing scenes, we actually learn that Red swapped with Adelaide when they first met all those years ago, meaning our supposed hero has actually been a tethered the whole time. When you rewatch the film, there are so many clues about Adelaide being not who she says she is though. The biggest is the fact that Adelaide stopped speaking after her encounter with her double. And this wasn't because she was traumatized, but because the tethered literally can't naturally speak. Also, while Adelaide is at the psychiatrist's office as a child, she organizes the toys in a straight line, which foreshadows Red's plan to have every tethered lineup across America to reveal themselves around the world. Number three, the cult's true intentions hereditary. Hereditary begins with Annie dealing with the death of her mother, Ellen. Because the two had a hostile relationship, Annie is somewhat relieved when Ellen has passed. But after Annie's daughter, Charlie, is decapitated in a horrific car crash, she becomes convinced that her mother is manipulating her life from beyond the grave. Eventually, though, Annie learns her mother was a cult member who worshipped the demon Paimon. Even worse, if it can get worse, Ellen has been shaping Annie's entire life for years, hoping that Paimon could be reincarnated in 
her children. And few viewers, myself included, see this revelation coming, even though the film actually leaves clues everywhere. For instance, Charlie beheads a pigeon which foreshadows her own fate, and just before Charlie has her head cut off, the party guests watch a video of someone being guillotined. It's pretty on the nose in hindsight. There's also the twist that Annie's friend Joan is actually a cult member as well. This is also hiding in plain sight, as she's seen buying a chalkboard that apparently belonged to her grandson who she'd use a seance to communicate with from beyond the grave, proving that she was just lying the whole time and buying the stuff she needed for the lie on the fly. Hey, that rhymed. Number two, the opening credits gave the twist away, Malignant. Malignant follows a young woman called Madison who suffers hallucinations which revolve around an unseen but extremely well-dressed freak who's performing horrific murders. During one of these visions, the murderer confides to Madison that he is Gabriel, an imaginary friend that she apparently created as a child, or so she thought. When detectives learn the murders that Madison has seen in her visions are actually happening in real life, they suspect that Gabriel is hiding in her house. And it's only when they confront Madison that the officers learn that Gabriel is actually a parasitic twin located on the back of her head. When Madison goes to sleep or gets knocked out, Gabriel takes over and uses her body to go on a delicious murder spree. However, the epiphany was actually revealed way, way earlier. In fact, it was unveiled before the opening credits had even finished. See, when the credits roll, we see dozens of medical images, including surgical procedures, fetal x-rays, and microscopic images of tumors. When this sequence shows Madison's medical papers specifically though, there are pages that state Madison's condition is similar to animals born with quote unquote, two heads, since she has two fully formed faces. By pausing at this point, the viewer can learn the entire plot within the first five minutes. Just for one extra as well, early on, Madison actually reassures herself that everything is all in her head, which, aye, she's not really wrong about that, is she? Number one, Rose doesn't want to leave any evidence. Get Out. Get Out centers on a black man called Chris meeting the family of his white girlfriend, Rose Armitage, for the very first time. Although Chris is worried that his relationship with Rose will pose a problem to a potentially racist family, the Armitages seemingly embrace him in their own cringy way. To Chris's horror though, he eventually learns that the Armitages are actually abducting black people and swapping the brains of their elderly friends into their bodies to cheat death. However, this revelation was implied over a dozen times throughout the movie because this is a Jordan Peele film and well, we've already seen what he does with us. This is just the guy's MO and I love it. For instance, when a cop asks for Chris's ID towards the start of the film, Rose goes absolutely berserk, implying that the officer is racist. And although it just looks like Rose is defending her boyfriend in this scene and we were all on her side, she's actually really avoiding a paper trail so no one will know where Chris went after her family dispose of him. Likewise, when Dean says that he likes to keep a piece of his mother in the kitchen, the camera cuts to the maid, demonstrating that she has the mind of Dean's mom. In hindsight, it's very unsubtle, but it's so, so cool. Still though, clues like this are so obvious on a second viewing that you can't understand how you didn't see the twist coming a mile away, and that's the sign of a really good reveal. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Did you pick up on any of these details the first time around? And are there any cool instances of foreshadowing and teasing like this that I missed off here. While you're down there as well, can you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to What Culture Horror for more lists like this on the regular. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.